Hello to everyone watching this video. My name is Ajitesh Anand, and I am a member of NADSIG, the Neurology and Neurosurgery Interest Group. We are starting a short interview video collection of neurologists and neurosurgeons across UK and abroad. Before we begin, I would like to state that most, if not all experiences shared today, will be based in Canada. Now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. White. Dr. White is a neurologist at the Alberta Health Services and a clinical associate professor at the University of Calgary. He is also an examiner for the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. I was, I'm not anymore Agitech. I uh, okay. finished my term there, but I have performed in that role, yes. All right. well, how are you doing? Well, thanks, yeah. Uh, well, thank you for having accepted our request to be interviewed, especially during these uncertain times. Oh, no worries. It was kind of exciting to be asked. I think that being a neurologist is an awesome thing. So happy to share my experiences. And if there are other people who are interested in it. They may be interested in hearing about it. Shall we begin with the questions then? Sure. Okay. So firstly, could you please tell me a bit about yourself? Like, where did you grow up? What did you study at university? And which universities did you study at? Sure, it's a little bit longer question. I was born in England, actually, and moved to Zambia when I was a little kid. Moved uh, back to England and then moved to Canada at age seven. So I got a lot of that travel done quite young. And I've been in Canada ever since. Uh, moved to Southern Ontario at 14 and really stayed in Southern Ontario until I finished all of my training and then moved out to Calgary. I did an undergraduate degree in biology and psychology combined degree at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. And uh, then I got into medical school at McMaster University, finished my medical school, and uh, started in a neurology residency at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. And uh, from there, when I was done, I did a fellowship in neuromuscular disease and EMG. And once I was done that, that's when I started working. I moved out to Calgary in Alberta in Canada. And I've been working here ever since. So that was since 1997, so 23 years. Right. Wow. <laughs> See, and when did you decide you wanted to become a neurologist then? Yeah, I was always interested in the brain and the mind. And uh, uh, when I got into med school, I thought I'd either want to do psychiatry or neurology. And uh, I, I had, uh, uh, you know, an awesome experience in all of my neurology electives. And it was pretty clear to me in medical school that uh, I would uh, really love doing neurology. I was lucky because I loved doing pretty much everything that I did. Okay. Um, but I was really passionate about neurology and fortunate to be able to do a neurology residency. So I would say probably in medical school, I decided to move more over to uh, neurology than psychiatry. Okay. But I thought about neurosurgery and other areas as well, but uh, yeah, clearly became neurology. Mm -hmm. So is there any certain memorable experience that uh, certainly made you pick neurology? Um. I love the thinking part of it. So it's funny, what made me pick neurology is perhaps not what, make, I, I love all of that part of it, but perhaps not what makes me love it so much now. But, um, but I, I always love the intellectual side of things. I love the importance and I still love the importance of the history and the physical examination. Uh, those parts are, you know, the history is probably more important in psychiatry, but probably in no other area of medicine. And the physical examination, I, I think it is, you know, the more, in all the areas of medicine, the physical exam is the most important in neurology. It's so eloquent. And then the sort of tying together the history and the physical first to localize the problem and then trying to understand what the problem is and then take it from there. So that, those parts I, I loved as a, as a medical student and I continue to love to this day for sure. So it was probably those things that were the things that sparked, sparked me the most in terms of wanting to be a neurologist. Mm -hmm. So you really enjoyed your education days and really reinforced. I did. I loved love medical school yeah. and uh, love my yeah. I loved all of it. Okay. Was any part of it stressful, or did you find any part of your career later on stressful? Yeah, there for sure is stress. It's a lot of work. It's always a, a lot of work. Although I would say that when you get into your own career, you've got more control over that kind of work as a medical student. Or a resident, you have very little control over how much work you're going to do um, as a staff person. So the volume of work and just being busy can, can be stressful. I've been very lucky to have a, a very supportive wife and family, and that helps me with uh, those sorts of things, I would say. Um, 
but you know my temperament is such that stress hasn't been a huge thing for me um and so i've been lucky that way but the the volume of work can be uh, significant for sure right so then what does a typical day look like as a neurologist so <laughs> it's funny because there's probably no such thing as a typical day so i have typical days so right now half of my time is spent doing clinical neurology and the other half of my time is spent doing uh clinical informatics work. So in Alberta now, we're trying to put it throughout the whole province, one electronic medical record. And so I spend half of my time doing that. But my neurology day, um, again, there will be two typical days. One would be an inpatient day and the other would be an outpatient day. Um, and I do more outpatient days than inpatient days, but my outpatient day, I would arrive uh, at, um, and usually we'd have some sort of a teaching round in the morning, starting at 7.30 to 8.30. And uh, then I would see patients in the morning in the neuromuscular clinic. I specialize in neuromuscular disease. Um, and it varies uh, these days uh, how many patients you would see. COVID has changed things a little bit. We're doing more things virtually now, which has been a, a change for me. And then in the afternoon, I would do uh, EMG uh, studies. So uh, I do that. They involve a, a consultation um, and then the electrophysiological studies that we do. And then within all of that, I almost always will have a, a trainee with me, either a, a resident or a neuromuscular fellow. And so I get to spend some time teaching during that as well. I've got to do dictation and paperwork and all of those things. Those are the things no one likes <laughs> about medicine. Right. Um, and then, you know, it just depends on the day. I, I, I'll usually get home between 6 and 6.30 on a clinical day. It can be later sometimes. Um, if I'm on the inpatient service, uh, again would go in usually meet the team at 8 15 in the morning uh, we may have uh, rounds or uh, sign over rounds or something we call rapid rounds where we'll review quickly with the nursing staff and the other people the patients that we would see and then we would go and do ward rounds and see the patients so go around and see all the patients on the service um, and that would be to do two things one to address their clinical needs and two to help uh, learn from those cases with the medical students and residents on the team uh, we can go and see consults on other services or down in the emergency department and those days are, are really variable you could get could be done by five or you might not be done and, and home until significantly later on those days so those would be sort of my two typical days okay right. and so has anything changed in the field of neurology then from the time you graduated to about present time Probably the biggest thing in, in my area, there have been two really big things I would say. The, the first has been the advent of uh, genetics. So um, being able to do exome sequencing uh, on my population of patients has made a huge difference into um, how easily we're able to make a diagnosis in patients with genetic diseases. So that, that's been a big difference. And the other really big difference I would say is a therapeutic difference with the advent of biologic agents. Um, Perhaps more so like in rheumatology and uh, inflammatory bowel disease and stuff like that, clearly they're a huge, huge part. But in neuromuscular disease where we're doing a lot of uh, immuno immunologically mediated disorders like myasthenia gravis or CIDP, we're also using these biologic agents as well. And they've uh, made a significant difference, I would say, in patient outcomes. Right. So then, like generally speaking, we see the gen like more of the research going toward genetics and um, helping to use research from that to better uh, treat patients, I guess, in the future? Uh, yeah, I think that we're, we're, I think the genetic explosion has been helpful in at least identifying a diagnosis in patients. Mm -hmm. And in a rare population, so perhaps one I'll tell you about the most exciting thing, in a very rare number of cases, it actually informs treatment. But most often now we're identifying them and it helps them understand what the disease means. But it also means we're able to identify the gene uh, better and try and understand the pathophysiology. But the treatment part for most of those genetic diseases, I think, is a long way away. But perhaps the coolest thing is, so I was the director of the ALS clinic, so you would call that motor neuron disease in the United Kingdom. And uh, we now have a, a patient who's in a trial for superoxide dismutase, and it hasn't quite stopped the disease in its tracks, but this is a uniformly fatal disease that just is relentlessly progressive. It's just, he was going downhill like this, and uh, he's sort of like this now. It's been amazing to see that. That's probably the coolest thing I've uh, seen. Wonderful, yeah. 
So how do you manage life outside your busy work day? Is there anything you do to help keep your stress down? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that's really important for everybody. And just a piece of advice is, is as important as your lifestyle is to you now, it will get more important over time and more difficult to manage. So it is a really important thing for people to think about. Um, yeah, exercise I think is important. It's very helpful for me. You know, just to, you know, when I go home, I try and keep home and work as, as very separate environments. So if I've got a late day at work, I, I do all my work at work. I try not to do it at home. Um, when I go home, I'm at home and I try not to think about work. Um, I've got a, a supportive wife. I've got my kids. They sort of ground me in things that are important. Uh, one thing I haven't done well, which I think it, it is important, is to try and cultivate other interests outside of medicine. Uh, I think that's a difficult thing for uh, some people to do, uh, but I think it's an important thing to do. And I wish I had done a better job at that, I would say. Yeah. So are there then any particular skills within the field of neurology that are beneficial, like um, being time efficient or that kind of um, yeah, I mean, being time efficient, I think, is helpful for, for everybody, for sure. I think being, uh, being thoughtful um, and trying to put everything together into the context of the patient, I think, is important. Like, it's one thing to have a long differential. It's one thing to be able to identify something on an examination, but it's another thing to try and integrate all of that into what it actually means for a patient. And I think as medical students, sometimes it's hard to understand the importance of integrating all of these facts of information um, and what they actually mean for the patient in their life. I think that's a really important thing to do in neurology and understanding, understanding um, what the disease means to the patient in terms of the rest of their life and how you're going to help them manage that. Right. And then I also, I know we talked about this briefly before, but um, how COVID-19 and the pandemic has changed your work day, but how has it impacted the neurology department as a whole? Yeah, so we've had to go to a backup call schedule because as soon as this started coming in for us, we lost 10 of our neurologists to being in quarantine, not because some of them because they had COVID, but many of them because they traveled somewhere else and come back. So we had to establish a backup call system. So it sort of effectively doubled the amount of time that we're on call, although when we're on backup, it's usually very, very quiet. So that's one thing. The second thing was that initially we had to cancel all of our inpatient clinic visits except for truly truly urgent or emergent clinic visits mm -hmm. um, and so there was a very significant impact uh, there in my area of neuromuscular disease the ability to physically assess a patient is really important as opposed to something like headache where maybe it's um, less important and so that was difficult for the patients uh, as things have gotten a little better we've loosened that up but we're still doing significant number of virtual visits mostly by the phone but some by zoom or video teleconferencing the inpatient service for us hasn't really changed very significantly yet. Uh, I think that if a second wave comes about and we begin to get overwhelmed, for sure it will. You know, we were all signing up to cover uh, ICU shifts or hospitalists for internal medicine shifts as well. Um, so that, that part, you know, hopefully that will stay away, but it could be an issue for us in the future. But we were mercifully pretty well prepared um, in Alberta Health Services for this. And so it didn't really affect our inpatient service much, except the gowning and the doffing and donning and all of that stuff. That made okay. you certainly less efficient. Yeah. yeah, I got to say Canada did quite well with um, managing the overall response to Corona. It's not over yet, but so yeah. far, yeah, we've been uh, fortunate, yes, I would say. And lastly, do you have any pearls of wisdom for our medical students and junior doctors willing to pursue a career in the field of neurology? Uh, no, I love doing what I do. I guess I would say that. I think, you know, it's a, it's a hard life. It, anything you do in medicine can be busy and hard. And so make sure you're doing something that you love. Sometimes it's hard to know exactly what that is when you're going through. The things that, you know, I talked about the things that I really enjoyed at the beginning. Things that I really, I think, feed me more in the long run are uh, the longitudinal patient care. Uh, you know, I really love that. I've got, I was just going and seeing one of my inpatients now. I've been following her for 20 years. She got admitted with uh, a pneumonia that's unrelated to her neurological disease, but the chance to just go by and say hi meant a lot to her and meant a lot to me. So those kinds of things are really important. 
and um, yeah, your relationship with your patients. That didn't seem like that would be a very important thing going into medicine to me, uh, but it's turned out to be the most uh, rewarding thing for me as well. And so make sure that you're always thinking about the patient as a person um, when you go through, and I think it will uh, allow you to feel rewarded in doing what you're doing as well. It's hard work, and if you don't find it rewarding on some level, it's going to be very difficult to do. Yeah. But if you do, it's awesome. I think it's one thing just to do to be doing your job and it's a whole other thing to be remembering patients and treating patients like the way that they shall remember you in the future as well yeah, yeah. for sure yeah. well thank you for your time today uh, it was a pleasure to interview today you today it was nice to see you again take care agitash <laughs>